Ten years ago, I was 33 years old, and I went to Jerusalem for the second time. One day I was wandering through the Arab market of the old city. I was taking in the colorful spices and scarves, enjoying the vibrant colors and smells, waving to all the shopkeepers. I was in that delicious state of mind that comes from traveling in a new place, where everybody feels like a whole new world. You know there's a new adventure just around the corner. Suddenly, my eyes fell on a distinctive stone archway, and I stopped in my tracks, frozen in time. I realized I had been here before, 14 years earlier, my first time in Jerusalem. I had been on an American university tour, and one day I had snuck away from the group to go on a solo exploration. I took a few random turns down a few random alleyways, and I found myself lost in the Arab market of the old city. But I remember distinctly, I wasn't enjoying the colorful spices and scarves. I wasn't waving at the shopkeepers. Nope. I was terrified for my life. You see, I'd been raised on a diet of media and everyday conversation that taught me that Arabs are dangerous that they hide giant Saracen swords under their robes, that they'll cut off my hand if they don't like my face, that as a woman, I'm somehow less than human. I remember the fear that I felt was true and deep. I remember running through the alleyways, clutching my bag against my body, sweating, searching desperately for an exit, which I found, incidentally, under that distinctive stone archway a portal in time between two moments, two moments in myself, of radically different experiences. <laughs> Today, as a sociologist and as a documentary filmmaker who thinks a lot about the challenges and opportunities of social diversity, I ask myself this question nearly every day. How do we help people get from the first experience, fear forged by stereotypes, to the second experience, one of curiosity, open-mindedness, and friendliness? Of course, I'm not the only one answering that, asking that question. There are thousands of diversity professionals out there planning diversity workshops that are mandated at universities and in workplaces all over the world. And we all really want to know, does diversity training work? or not. In fact, I discovered that there are a lot of TED Talks out there with similar titles, Why Diversity Training Doesn't Work. And in fact, they're all a little bit right. A typical diversity workshop might not work because it's too superficial, just checking the compliance box. It might be too reassuring for people who are required to be there. It might be too short. One Diversity session a year about gender discrimination won't create a real paradigm shift. It might be totally focused on quantitative diversity, how many people of color are in the room. Ironically enough, some diversity trainings seem to want us all to think and speak the same way about diversity. In fact, President Trump even issued an executive ban against diversity trainings in federal spaces because they were thought to be too coercive and overly leftist. And the research even shows that diversity training is less effective when it's mandated, when it imposes sanctions on participants, or when there's a spotlight on members of privileged social demographics and they're made to feel defensive or alienated. Now, these are all really important considerations to hold in mind. And yet, we are in a zeitgeist of diversity training, especially since the summer of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd. Hundreds of thousands of people are going through these trainings, and that makes us extra anxious about this question of whether our efforts are going in the right direction or not. So, I'm here today to help us relax a little bit about this question of whether it's working, because I have a very vague answer for you. Different diversity trainings work differently for different people at different times. I know that's not the satisfying binary yes or no that we really want, but it makes sense. Because diversity trainings, just like us, are complex works in progress. 
A mandated diversity training can offer us structured and research-based methods for reaching across a crevasse of social difference, but no diversity training is perfect. In fact, it is rightfully a partial component of the lifelong project of living in meaningful connection with other people and developing resilience in the face of the challenges of social diversity. Let's talk a little bit more about these challenges. Why is it so hard for us to achieve social inclusivity? For starters, we are cognitively predisposed against anything that we perceive to be other. From the beginning of our species, 350,000 years ago, your brain has had one job, to keep you safe. And your survival fitness has greatly increased when you're close to your group. So your clever brain has developed some very clever ways to do some lightning fast calculations to determine who exactly is in your group and who is not. And these are called cognitive biases. Scientists have discovered that there are more than 180 cognitive biases operative in our brain at any given time. It does make us really efficient in our social worlds, but there are some drawbacks. The brain that is so good at favoring those who are like me and being very skeptical and cautious about those who are not like me has a default setting that looks a lot like xenophobia, fear of the stranger. And our brain hasn't had enough time to evolve and take into account our diverse modern world. We've only really lived in conditions of potentially egalitarian social diversity for about 200 years, maybe since the Industrial Revolution. So that's about 0.05% of our species existence. Let me put that into a perspective that's a little bit relatable. In a 90-year human lifespan, that's 16 days. So we're really just babies at this diversity thing. Speaking of babies, I'll throw another wrench in the works. From the earliest weeks of our infancy, we are subject to a process that sociologists call socialization. That's how we're shaped by our social environments as we move through our life. Our knee-jerk fear of the stranger is powerfully reinforced by the biases that we're exposed to in our families, at our workplaces, in our schools, and definitely in the media. Between our xenophobic cave person brains and all that social reinforcement of biased messages, it's like diversity and equity barely stand a chance. And this has had calamitous effects on our human family. Discrimination is one of the oldest human problems, and it's also one of the costliest. There is a seemingly endless list of spin-off problems. Labor and housing discrimination, lost wages, depression and suicide, police brutality, war, genocide. The list can go on and on. In fact, I can even put a price tag on it. In 2020, researchers found that racism and sexism cost the U.S. economy $16 trillion. So that's a concrete reason to work on this problem. Also, if for no other reason, then diversity is inevitable. It's not going anywhere. Within 20 years, the white, non-Hispanic majority population of the U.S. will be a minority. But here's a better reason. In 2019, a Boston consulting group found that diverse management teams enjoyed 19 to 36 percent more revenues due to innovation. So between our knowledge of the costs of discrimination, the inevitability of diversity, and the concrete, be <clears throat> and the concrete benefits of cooperation across social divides, in this zeitgeist of diversity training, we have a lot of momentum at exactly the right moment to devise diversity trainings that really work. Ah, but what works, you may ask? What can actually possibly shift these deeply stubborn biases in our brains and in our social groups? Sociologists who study bias and de-biasing have identified two major levers for social change. Self-awareness, of why we act the way we do, and meaningful contact across social divides. So let's go back to my epiphany 
in the Arab market of Jerusalem. What happened to me in that 14-year period that created such a radically different experience, and yet one that I didn't even notice in myself? For starters, I developed a lot of self-awareness about my media socialization, how Muslims in the Arab world were portrayed in American news and seemingly innocent sources of media, like cartoons, had planted a fear in my young brain that was deeply gripping. Have you guys ever noticed in Disney's Aladdin that the bad guys speak with thick Arabic accented English, but the good guys sound just as American as G.I. Joe? That sort of thing sinks into a young brain in ways that they don't even notice. Between my media socialization and my everyday conversations and my own xenophobic cave person brain, I was sleepwalking in the matrix of some very deeply held biases. And it wasn't until I developed some more self-awareness about where those ideas were coming from and how my brain was very talented at hanging on to them that I was able to sort of shift that load. I also, in those 14 years, had a lot of meaningful contact with new Muslim friends through my travels and schooling, through studying the religions of the world and practicing interreligious dialogue, through my fair share of diversity trainings. But how do we translate that into a diversity workshop? Can you put self-awareness and meaningful contact into a bottle? As we say on Facebook, it's complicated. There's no one-size-fits-all diversity training. But I must say, there are certainly some best practices so that your diversity training can pack more of a punch. In my experience, and according to mounting evidence, documentary film has immense potential as a social change agent. If you want your message to hit both the heart and the mind, documentary film is a sort of de-biasing power tool. First of all, scientists have discovered that media images, digital visual storytelling, affects us on a personal level in much the same way with the same level of impact as a face-to-face -face encounter. So documentary film can give us that experience of meaningful contact across social divides. And meaningful contact gives us a sense of the complexity of the other person, disrupting superficial stereotypes. It also gives us a sense of common ground with a person or a group we might not have imagined we had anything in common with. It's a cost-effective, convenient way of traveling into a foreign world without even living, leaving your living room couch. But there's another reason documentary film packs such a punch for the brain. Visual information. It embeds directly into your long-term memory and constitutes about 90% of the information that we ultimately retain. But you can't just watch one documentary film and change the world. Just like you can't go to one afternoon a year of a gender discrimination training and have a paradigm shift. Nope. You've got to watch a series, for instance. I propose an episodic docu-series because that allows your brain to practice the experience of meaningful contact, to form new neural pathways, new positive emotional associations, paving the way for friendliness and curiosity. It's almost like a magic recipe. A good story, well told, with a visual component, advancing a positive or at least accurate representation of a social group, watched repeatedly over time. It's pleasant, memorable, accessible, and it hits all the marks of effective diversity training. But look, one diversity training alone cannot mitigate the challenges of unharmonious diversity in an embattled society. No diversity training is perfect, but it can be in a very important part of making peace with the unfamiliar out there and the uncomfortable parts of ourselves. In order to affect real change, you have to have something shift on two levels. You need a legal solution, but you also need a plan to change the culture. And cultural change requires a really long-term vision and multiple approaches. If diversity training 
is able to be sensitive to the diversity that we bring to our schools and our workplaces, and especially if it has a visual component and is repeated over time, it does have the potential to bring us into a fuller collective harmony. It has the potential to leverage the creativity at the heart of pluralism. So, let's try to go into diversity training with an open mind. It's a work in progress. And it probably is never going to be as exciting as my epiphany in the Arab market of Jerusalem. But, with some luck, it certainly doesn't have to be a drag. <laughs>